Morning. How how's the morning been so far? Uh early, but I'm excited to be here and thank you for having me. Excellent. Well, take it away. Uh the stage yeah. is now all yours. Thanks. I'm just going to share a screen very quickly. Hope you guys can see this. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. It's a very difficult time in India today. The COVID pandemic is spiraling out of control. Many of the com communities we work to help, empower, and enable are struggling. And I hope through this talk, you will appreciate what a remarkable country India is, how resilient we are, and how we're going to get past this. So if you look at biodiversity across the world, the first thing that comes to mind is extinction. And where does extinction happen? How does it happen? I started to look at this for India. Uh, over the last 200 years, uh, documenting what ha had happened to India's wildlife. And my research established that starting in the 1820s all the way up to the 1950s, there was widespread hunting of wildlife. Uh, people went out on shoots, uh, shot tigers, rhinos, elephants, bear, what name you, in these large hunting parties. And they shot tigers from cars. Uh, and this had direct consequences. An environmental historian has estimated that we've lost over 80 to 100,000 tigers in a 100 year period, several thousand leopards, wolves, and many other species. And we also lost this beautiful cat, the cheetah, which was declared extinct in the 1960s. So I think uh, there was this rapid collapse of megafauna that took place. But And what ha has happened as a consequence of it is that lions are gone from 96% of India. Tigers are gone from 67% of India. Wild dogs are gone from 62% of India. Gaur are gone from 60% of India. Chinkara are gone from 58% of India. Rhinos are gone from 55% of India. Elephants are gone from 43% of India. Sloth bears are gone from 38% of India. Leopards are gone from 36% of India. And even pigs are gone from 25% of India. It's a remarkable story of how wildlife has collapsed across the country. But a lot of conservation has taken place. Post-independence, particularly starting in the 1970s, India put in a lot of efforts. We established parks, we set up Project Tiger, Project Elephant, and really put in a concerted effort to bring wildlife back. And in some sense, bringing wildlife back has worked in certain parts of India, and we see high human wildlife conflict because of that today. India is one of the 17 megadiversity countries. But what sets us apart from the rest of the planet is that we have less than 5% of land set aside in protected wildlife areas dedicated solely for nature. This land is also shared with 1.4 billion people struggling to cope and coexist with wildlife. We truly are a melting pot for wildlife. We share species with all continents around the world, wolves, bears, and foxes with North America and Europe, lions, bustards, hyenas with Africa, tigers, rhinos, and a whole bunch of other species with South, South and Southeast Asia. But conflict is a serious issue. And what do I mean by conflict? It's people losing crops. It's people having their houses injured. And in retaliation, electrocuting elephants like this one. It's also people having their livestock injured, livestock killed, and chasing leopards and poisoning tigers. This is the very reality that we have to confront and address and hope uh, we can pe uh, empower people to cope with. So as a 37-year-old conservation organization in India, we have several things that we focus on, starting with empowering people. Uh, people are a huge part of uh, these wildlife protected areas, and estimated 50 to 100 million people depend on these parks. And uh, they live very difficult lives, a high human wildlife conflict, very poor access to healthcare, education, and most things that most of us take for granted. Over the last 12 years, we've done research across India documenting that India has a reported 80 to 100,000 incidents of human wildlife conflict to which the government pays compensation. 
But our research has also established that less than 30% of people are filing in most places. So the estimated numbers are actually much, much higher. To address this, we've done several things. We've worked with Vidhi Center for Law and Policy to evaluate which states are ma uh, managing conflict, how are they uh, managing conflict, looking at existing policies and how to improve them. And we believe that uh, although uh, there are many, many effective procedures in place, we can standardize them, we can improve them, and we can certainly improve the transparency and the efficiency of the claims process. One such project that I'm very proud of is a wild savvy program launched in Bandipur and Nagarhole five and a half years ago. We have now assisted file almost 18,000 claims of human wildlife conflict. People call us when they have a leopard on their roof, an elephant in their farm, and any other challenge they face. Our field staff get to the situation, help file the claim, and the government pays the compensation today. After we started implementing the Wild Save program, we noticed that kids living around these parks are not excited about seeing tigers, are not excited about seeing elephants. And we launched this conservation education program called Wild Shale, Shale meaning school. Before the pandemic hit, the program reached um, 407 schools in and around wildlife parks. We reached 20,000 children. And today, we hope once the pandemic is over, we can scale to reach two and three and a half thousand schools and 200,000 children to get them excited about wildlife, for, to give them ways to cope with conflict. And it, to me, the true success story is us implementing Wild Save for many years and yet not getting calls from certain villages. What happened when we got uh, while Shale going, we had kids tell their parents to call the Wild Save team. And I think this is how conservation needs to work, it, not in pieces, but connected to each other. And most recently, we've launched the Wild Surakshir program. Last year in March, as the pandemic was flattening the world, uh, our team thought very hard about what can we do. We were about to launch a public outreach safety program focused on conflict. How do you stay safe from elephants and tigers? What do you do if someone is injured? But we realized that we had to go beyond the large animals. We had to look at wildlife diseases. We had to look at zoonotics. So we dug deep did our research and established that in the Western Ghats in Southern India, where we work, there were six common zoonotics, include COVID-19. In September, we launched this program, and I'm very proud of my team for working in these extremely difficult conditions. We've gone out there, conducted 150 workshops in the most remote rural communities, walking people through what is conflict, what are zoonotics, why does it happen and how do you stay safe? Thanks to our effort, we have 4,000 people who participated in these workshops from community organizations, government, forest and health departments, and primary healthcare workers. And now, as India is seeing the worst of the second wave, we're launching an extension to the Surakshay program, which is to actually help the primary healthcare centers. We've contacted the people who participated in our workshops. We've assessed and identified which primary health centers are in most need. What do they need? So please help us adopt a primary health center in India today and enable these communities who are living on the margins, coping with conflict, also cope with COVID-19. And how do we do this? We believe very strongly in the uh, in, in technology and the role it's played. So our amazing tech team at, Bank, uh, in, at CWS has built Wild, Wild Connect, a platform on which all our conservation programs are housed. People, our staff working in different parts of India report in daily on what they were able to do and document very meticulously the impacts of our program. We do pre and post surveys with the children in the Wild Chalet schools. We do pre and post surveys with uh, the people participating in the Wild Surakshe program. So fundamentally, we believe very strongly that rebuilding people's lives, enabling them to cope with loss, disease, conflict is a huge way to empower those people who live next to wildlife in our parks across India. The second bit is very much the role of science and technology. We've, we have enabled science and technology in all our work going back 37 years. We started as India's premier tiger organization, looking at how to count tigers, estimate tiger populations, and grew it to 
um, elephants, leopards, and a variety of birds, mammals, and amphibians. Today, we've gone beyond iconic charismatic species. Uh, we work on a multitude of species, and I think this is important, uh, but we need to extend this to how do you enable and empower people as well. So our uh, focus also now involves simple technological solutions like WildSaver does using a mobile phone. Uh, we partner with many organizations to look at innovative remote sensing, uh, to uh, document land cover change and infrastructure impacts on wildlife. We're also partnering with Rainforest Connection in the US to set up acoustic monitoring to see, can we set up early warning systems using acoustic mon monitoring? I'm very excited about this new project that we're about to undertake. Of course, we believe very much that everything that we do has to doc be documented. And as a scientist, so publications are sort of the benchmark. We continue to publish in the best journals around the world, which document our insights from running these research and conservation projects, as well as document what doesn't work and what works. And the last focus, of course, is that can we aspire for an India where more than 5% is set, for, set aside for wildlife and uh, wild places, and how do we get people and wildlife to coexist? We've worked on private uh, plantations of tea, coffee, rubber, documenting incredible bird and amphibian diversity. We're hoping to build a partnership of organizations where wildlife-friendly practices, whether you're an individual landholder or a large company, become the norm. We're working to look at agroforestry as a uh, supplement or replacement to farming in places where there's high human wildlife conflict and there's climate change. And we're also looking to extend the benefits of tourism beyond the local community to the local communities beyond a few people who actually benefit. India's growing e uh, uh, economy is resulting in a 400, 500 million middle class who now want to visit many of our parks. And our tiger parks are, are sort of the focus of this. We want to take this beyond the tiger parks and make sure the benefits from tourism reach many more people. And ultimately, it's very, very clear, uh, pandemic or not, we have to create living landscapes that makes space for people and wildlife. We are now focusing very strategically on the Western Ghats biodiversity hotspot in India because it's a remarkable richness of life. Uh, several uh, critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable species, but also home to 27 million people who come into direct daily contact in wildlife in some way, uh, form of the other. So I feel that you empower people, you create space, but you ensure that there's coexistence that needs to take place. So our mission today is very much focusing on wildlife and wild places. Uh, I started as a scientist 23 years ago. I grew into becoming a conservationist and educator. And now we're having to learn about public health and how to support people during public health emergencies. So I think uh, most of the times in conservation, you start out as one thing and you learn to evolve, you adapt, and you learn that if you don't include, involve, and support people, we're not going to succeed in our mission. And ne that is never more obvious than the pandemic today. I'm very excited about the work we're doing. I think we have uh, innovative solutions at the Center for Wildlife Studies. Um, we have solutions that can scale, not just through uh, India, but can be adapted for other places in the world. What is very obvious is um, Indian Indians have high tolerance for wildlife. We have a high, deep connect to nature, which has allowed all of these per species to persist among, amidst us. But we also need to solve uh, people's problems. And I think programs like Wild Seve, Wild Shale, and Wild Surakshet do exactly that. Some of them are short-term solutions, looking at conflict mitigation and adaptation. Some of them are long-term solutions, educating children, preparing the next stewards for wildlife. And some of them are responding to something that's taking place like a pandemic today through the Wild Surakshay program. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I've had one of the most amazing uh, childhood because of my father. I spent the first 17 years just watching animals. It's not something I can do with my kids today. Uh, although 
our focus, uh, my focus and my inspiration ha has been to do science and conservation. We have now gone well beyond that to do education and public health outreach. Um, thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much again for your presentation, Dr. Kriti. It was very insightful and very, very moving. Um, I know it's it's a very difficult time for, for India at this point in time. Um, I, I have a question, actually. You were talking about the 150 workshops, you know, um, that you were giving uh, about conflict and zoonotics. How has that been received, actually? So uh, they've been really uh, received brilliantly because fundamentally, when you have to uh, involve people in solving these problems, uh, you have to go to the front lines, go to these remote places where actually zoonotic diseases occur and where actually conflict occurs. Uh, being nerdy scientists, we've also done evaluations, pre and post surveys, and which are showing that there is the, we have certainly increased awareness and understanding of conflict and zoonotics, who people should call for help, what kind of help they need to get. But I think we also have individual instances, you know, where uh, people who participated in our workshops today, uh, when they have a snake bite incident or an incident with an elephant, they call us back and say, because of what we heard, uh, we are able to respond and uh, react more effectively. And I think even more exciting is the fact that we worked with frontline uh, community organizations, uh, public health, staff who were not aware of the sort of the in, in uh, uh, intricate connections between people and wildlife and so they got more health information that they then take on to all the beneficiaries they meet as part of their regular regular life and job excellent thank you so much there is a question from the chat group actually um so the question reads i understand how agroforestry could be beneficial to insects and birds is it also beneficial for the conservation of large mammals and how? So fundamentally, the lack of space and, you know, there is a spillover of large wildlife, particularly elephants, tigers that come outside. And they, they're you coming outside because of uh, multiple reasons, natural dispersal, coming outside because they've moved through these uh, uh, villages and these landscapes historically for hundreds of years. They're also coming outside uh, because there's tasty food sometimes. And what we're hoping to do with our agroforestry work is that you supplement what is nat naturally protected by the government by working with local communities to reforest parts of their land. Uh, we have two amazing PhD scientists who have looked at willingness of people to do this. And our research has shown that they are interested because they're simply fed up of dealing with conflict, unable to make a living uh, from agriculture and also are uh, additionally facing climate change impacts. So I think uh, this coalition of creating space has to be built through individuals, communities and private partnerships. Yes, it really does take a village, right? <laughs> Absolutely, or many villages. <laughs> yes, a whole, a whole load of villages all working together. Absolutely. Um, there's another question. So it reads, has it been challenging to get the governments involved in these programs? Uh, it's Honestly, it's been a mixed bag. We always do our best to work with the government. Uh, the Wild Chalet pro, uh, program has been welcomed by the education department because they know we're going to these government schools where teachers often can't show up and there are very limited resources. The Wild Surakshe program has been also welcomed by the health department because they call us uh, the guys who will go to the last mile villages that they themselves can't get to. So both those programs, we have wonderful partnerships with the education and health departments. Great, thank you so much. All right, we still have more questions for you. Um, so uh, hello, Dr. Kriti, excellent presentation. How do you evaluate the impact of your interventions? So uh, we do pre and post surveys. Uh, in the case of the Chalet program, uh, we've now reached 20,000 children and I think over 90% of them been, uh, have been evaluated. And it's very difficult to do a pre and post survey with a child. It's not like you can just sit down and give them a bunch of questions. And have. So we have figured out very interesting visual ways and 
um, sort of uh, read out questions and get them to fill. The forms are obviously much simpler than what you would give an adult. But uh, all of these children, before we start the program, we evaluate what is their environmental knowledge, uh, what is their interest in wildlife, and what do they know about conflict. And we're now adding a module on zoonotic diseases. We're also adding a mo uh, module on uh, health. And we're going to continue to uh, broaden what, uh, obviously, we have limited time and resources, but we're realizing that the conversation also has to evolve as the challenges in the world evolve. With the adults, obviously, it's much easier. We do pre-service uh, similarly to establish what do they know about zoonotics or conflict. And we do our follow-up surveys uh, after a certain period of time so that they've had time to absorb and uh, reflect on what they've learned and then passed on to others in the community. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question. Wow, this is really good. <laughs> Lots of questions for your segment um, from uh, Nadia. This is a really interesting one. Um, since you have such incredible partnerships with diverse parties in your programs, how do you manage these partnerships and expectations? Uh, I, I, you know, I don't think anybody can do this alone. Uh, and we're constantly building new partnerships because when it comes to zoonotics, uh, we partner with Institute of Public Health and a lot of amazing health organizations in India. Uh, for policy, we partner with Vidhi. We partner with a ton of US, UK, Canadian, European universities, as well as Indian universities, right? Because that's what makes us better at asking the question. That's what makes us better at answering it. And uh, yes, we have a, a team of 60, but we're all extremely driven, organized, and passionate. So we can, but we also recognize that we can't do this as one organization, that it has to be partnerships with others. What I'm hoping is to actually build more global partnerships. Uh, you know, I think thanks to the Rolex Award for Enterprise that I got last year and the Wild uh, uh, Innovator Award that came uh, just recently, we've you know, I've connected to so many other amazing scientists and conservationists. I met Topher White uh, because of the Rolex Awards. And today we are working together to look at this acoustic monitoring. And I think, you know, every this is the most frustrating part about this pandemic is because you're not out there meeting people in person and having those fun discussions over coffee or a drink and, and moving it forward. Instead, you're doing all of this on Zoom and, and there's just uh, the organic chemistry goes away. Well, maybe we can take a rain check and actually meet in person once this whole pandemic is sorted you know, out. I'd love to. I'd love to. <laughs> um, okay, we have another question here for you um, from Richik. Um, can we convert our farmlands into forest land by taking up the hydroponic uh, techniques of farming? I'm not an expert on hydroponics. I know people have done this, uh, but I'm not going to uh, kind of go out there and actually talk about it because I'm not an expert on hydroponics. Yeah. All right. Um, so do you have any last words for the, the audience um, with regards to um, how they can get involved if they want to support you and your work? Um, how do they reach you? Uh, what's the best Absolutely. way Absolutely. Um, uh, we are uh, registered in India. Uh, our website is uh, www.cwsindia.org. Uh, you can also write to me at kriti.current at cwsindia.org. We're also registered in the U.S., um, um, so please reach out, please volunteer, please uh, partner, please donate, please support us in many different ways that you can. Thank you so much, Kriti. Stay safe and take care. Thank you very much. <laughs>